Still in Turkana, this day was another lucky day because the waters of Lake Turkana were calm and we could take the boat ride to Central Island. Turkana is beyond beautiful. Remember I said my love for Lake Victoria was overtaken by another lake? This was it. The boat ride was fun and scenic, with the sun still rising and when you look back, you could see the desert sand dunes along the shores of Lake Turkana. We reached Central Island and as it has been for most parts of the trip, we were again not ready for how challenging the walk will be. The island had a few hill climbs which were not steep. You gradually climb up a hill which sounds fun and easy until you realize you are doing it in 36 degrees Celsius and it's only 9 am in the morning. The route was very scenic though and I took some amazing shots during the climb. Central Island is classified under the UNESCO World Heritage Program which seeks to protect areas of significance. The island has three lakes namely Crocodile Lake, Flamingo Lake and Tilapia Lake. The lakes had fitting names since we could see the crocodiles and the flamingos. We spent about two hours walking the hiking route before going back to our boat and riding back to Elie Springs. Reaching Elie, it was still early and we decided to do a drive back to Kitale as we continued with our journey. A quick stop in Lodwa to fuel, we proceeded for roughly 100 kilometers before the car just failed. At this point we were not sure what the problem could be. We had cleaned the bad fuel from the previous mishap and went on to drive about 300 kilometers without any issues. The previous mishap couldn't have been the issue and this will make sense later because guess what, we killed another car, but we will get there. The car displayed several errors on the dashboard. The check engine light was on, a hazard sign and a sign written 4LO. This caused the car to not accelerate beyond 40 km per hour, even on a very tiny hill. This became a problem because the route involved climbing a lot of hills going through the Cherengani hills. Our solution was to drive for a few kilometers and whenever the car lost power, we would switch it off, remove the battery terminal and give it a few minutes before proceeding. We continued to do this until we managed to reach Kitale late at night. Our aim was to reach Kitale because this is where the closest Toyota service center was located. We reached Kitale late at night around 8 pm and slept in an Airbnb. We had avoided driving at night through the journey because there's a curfew in Kenya from 10 pm to 5 am as part of the COVID restrictions. This turned out to be a very slow day that thinking about it right now, actually went very well. First stop was the Toyota service center in Kitale. They spent two hours working on the car and they said the car had a lot of dust and needed cleaning. I'm not a car nerd, therefore didn't know what the solution for that was. The car didn't have any errors and they assured us it was perfect. It wasn't. 70 kilometers from Kitale, the problem came back with all the lights on the dashboard lighting up again. The only advantage this time was that the speed during hill climbs was not affected and therefore we were able to drive till evening. At this point, Jane had already talked to the rental car company and they were going to give us a second car. We drove through Eldoret town all the way to Iten. We stopped for a few minutes in Iten taking pictures of a road sign. Iten is famously known as the home of marathon runners since most of Kenya's marathon runners come from the area. Here, they get to train at higher altitude which helps in building endurance. Our next quick stop was at the El Geo Maraqued viewpoint. I thought the sign written EMC was a tribute to Albert Einstein, but it just meant El Geo Maraqued County. Blonde moments. 
We dropped down the escarpment and made another stop at the Tambach Museum, which was along the way. We had a quick view of the museum, which holds some political significance. It was one of the oldest towns established back in 1820 as a British colonial outpost. It was later changed to offices of district commissioner after independence. The original building is still standing in the site. We then continued down the escarpment for another stopover at the Cabernet Museum. Here, there was a showcase of the culture of the Kalenjin tribe, who are the occupants of the area. The car problems had kind of affected the general mood of the travel, but the road down the escarpments was beyond magical. I can confidently say that the Iten to Baringo road is the most scenic road in Kenya. The landscape has an amazing winding road and hills that look they were carefully placed. We continued the drive down with several stopovers, admiring the views until we reached the shores of Lake Baringo. Here, we were able to secure a boat for the next day and retired to a nearby hotel. The car rental company was able to deliver the second car to the hotel and we hoped all will be well, but as it happened to be, the car problems were not over. There has been a lot of stories about the rising water levels of lakes along the Rift Valley. It is suspected that this is as a result of lots of rain from 2019 and 2020, and also effects of climate change. We saw how the water levels had risen in Lake Turkana, but in Lake Baringo, we had even a bigger picture of how the situation was. We took a boat early in the morning for a 1 hour 30 minutes boat ride. During the ride, we could see a lot of structures that were submerged inside the water because of the rising levels. Some hotels were completely decommissioned and structures and homesteads abandoned. This is the reality that you are going to see while visiting all the other lakes along Rift Valley. We drove to the Olkokwe Island inside Lake Baringo, which has hot springs, before riding back to the mainland. Back to the mainland, the next destination was to be Lake Bogoria, and there was supposed to be a tarmac road that goes along Lake Baringo all the way to Lake Bogoria. Only one slight problem, the entire road was underwater. The flamingos stopped us right at our tracks. We took some pictures and had to trace back our route to go around several kilometers. We drove down to Nakuru town which is one of the major towns in Kenya. While in Nakuru, we made a quick stopover at Lodigaton Castle which was built back in 1938 by a British baron during the colonial period. The time was around 2 pm and we decided to take a shot at reaching Lake Bogoria again. We got lost for a bit and found ourselves to the lesser known Lake Solai, which is still in the floor of the Rift Valley. After asking for directions, we were told to use a shortcut, which was a dirt road and because of how bad the road was, it ended up being a long cut. We reached Lake Bogoria at 4.30 pm, late in the evening. My childhood memory of going to Lake Bogoria was boiling eggs in the hot springs. I didn't have any eggs this time round, but I completely forgot just how stunning the lake was. The lake looked perfectly placed with the escarpments rising all around it. The lake also had the highest number of flamingos yet. We spent about an hour driving around and stopped at the hot springs and I think I have a thousand pictures of flamingos from this one location only. It was running late and there were no accommodations nearby. This was a result of the rising water levels and also COVID. We set to drive back to Nakuru. Along the way, around 50 kilometers out of Nakuru, we got another puncture. If you are counting, this brings the total number of punctures to four. In Nakuru town, the main attraction is Lake Nakuru, which is inside the Nakuru National Park. But first, we needed to repair another tire puncture because you can't risk going to a park without a spare wheel. 
We fixed the tire, then did a quick visit to the Herax Hill Museum. The museum showcases the culture of the tribes in the area and also has prehistoric sites that are centuries old. We went up the hill and had a good view of the entire Nakuru town and a view of the lake. Around 11 am, we went to Lake Nakuru National Park. We first accessed the park via the main gate and the guards were able to show us the famous 3 meters high gate that is now underwater. To have access to the park, we had to go around and access it via the Lanet gate. By the time we were in the park, it was already noon, which is not the best time to be in a park because animals are less active and it is hard to spoil them. We drove around for about two hours before deciding to exit the park and head towards Naivasha. We made a quick stop at Lake Elementaita. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a good view of the lake since most of it is not accessible because of hotels fencing most parts. We gave up on that and decided to proceed to Naivasha. The ride to Naivasha was quite interesting for me because Albert, who was driving, got his first real experience of driving on a busy Kenyan road. Trust me, you only need to do it to have an opinion of your own. You might enjoy it or you might hate it, but at the end of the day, you just have to be aggressive to survive. Our plan was to view Lake Naivasha the next day and so we slept in an Airbnb which was just nearby.